Hello everyone, uh, and uh, the webinar uh, is just filling up, so we'll just hang here as people uh, start to arrive. Make yourself comfortable. Um, uh, this this lunchtime here in the UK, um, grab a grab a cup of tea or uh, whatever you fancy at lunchtime, um, and uh, and welcome to the uh, third part of Usher U's Future of Film Marketing. Um, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about film and brands. As in, is, is film a brand? And if it is, what does, that, what does that mean for our marketing? And how can we use that idea of brands and brand building to really drive our marketing forward um, and create more effective campaigns. Um, and also we're thinking about the future, of course, this is the future of film marketing. Uh, and so we're gonna be looking, looking ahead as well and thinking how, uh, discussing with the panel, yeah, how, how can we take this concept of branding forward in a, um, in a, in a future, uh, environment in a post pandemic environment. So, um, I'd like to introduce our panel today. Uh, so, firstly, um, we have uh, Ollie Fegan, who is CEO of Usher U, Tom Greveson, head of distribution at Hanway, head of marketing and distribution, so, excuse me, Tom, at Hanway Films. Daniel Roby is CEO of ThinkJan, and Fanola Carrigan, who is Professor of Marketing at the University of Birmingham. Uh, so, yeah, so as I said, we're talking about film brands. Our mission today is really to explore this uh, and to get insights, but I, I'd like to start with, um, with Fanola. Um, Fanola, tell me, um is is a film a brand um and in your opinion and, and yeah tell me a bit about your your research and thought into this area yeah thanks very much it's nice to be here today um so my approach to thinking about branding and film is very much uh about what thinking about what is branding and so for me branding is about telling stories so branding film is about telling a story about the story and so within that, I think it's helpful, rather than debating endlessly, is a film a brand, is it not a brand? It's more about thinking about, if you think about a film as a brand, what benefit does that bring you? And for me, it allows you to break down a film to understand how people outside of that project might approach it or understand it. And so uh, in research that I've done with a colleague, Dara O'Reilly, we broke down all of the areas of a film that could be considered a brand. So for us, a film itself can be a brand, but uh, an actor can be a brand, a director can be a brand, a producer can be a brand, um, a DOP can be a brand, a distributor can be a brand, and, the, the, and even the, co the country of origin of the film. And what we mean by that is that each of these will have some kind of association in the mind of the consumer. So the audience who might think about watching it, or other people in the industry, will have some kind of um, meaning they associate with each of these people. So what projects have they worked on before? What kind of stories are they generally involved in? And then importantly for us in terms of looking at a film as a brand is when all of those things are put together in one project, how does that make sense? So we often see unusual casting or an unknown actor or something like that. Uh, rather than think, okay, I can't put, you know, this actor who's known for drama in a comedy because people won't buy it. You think, okay, that's our marketing, that's our marketing question. That is the, the, the thing we have to explain to people. Or sometimes that's the thing we have to hide away from people because they won't be able to make sense of that in relation to the other elements of the brand. So for me, I think branding is incredibly helpful in terms of thinking about this, but also in the film industry, because of how projects are set up and the, the range of companies that are always involved in a project. Sometimes what you have is brand confusion. So 
so many different companies claiming uh, kind of a, an element of a brand. And so then that can be challenging. And that's where we see this idea of co-branding really important. So you associating yourself with other production companies or distrib distribution companies, uh, that then changes how people think about your brand. So brands change every single time they have an association with anyone else. The meaning in the minds of people outside of that will change. Mm. Is that something um, that is just like inevitable or is that something we, we have to sort of think about when we're yeah. putting together our, uh, and at what state are we, are we, are you talking about when people launch their marketing campaigns or yeah. is that just literally when the package comes together and you've got your director and your, your cast and your scripts yeah. and is that, is that when it happens? I think it's inevitable because I think the way we approach film is we look for all these clues. What is it? What's it about? Like how, you know, and other research I've done with um, Andy Hart and Dirk Von Lane, we looked at how people make sense of the information that they see about films before they select them. And it's very much each time they classify them. Okay, that looks like it's a comedy, but why is that actor in it? Or, oh, that director has made something interesting. Is this going to be challenging? You know, so we go through that period. And I think that, um, you know, for me, I did my PhD on marketing and independent film. And the one thing I took away from that, which I did a long time ago, was that at the very point of conception behind a project, you have to think about how does this make sense to people? And then how do I start telling that story so that they'll understand what this project is or that they'll understand the benefit of this to them? So how will it improve their lives by watching this film? Mm. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you, so uh, what, what then, so you like f film is this, 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 you know, collection of different brand signifiers or like things that people, audience can relate to. Um, uh, what, what, what then, cons what, what's, what, what does a brand uh, consist of? What are the elements which form like a, a traditional brand? What are the sort of things which we, if you're coming well, out of a brand for like a new product or something. What yeah, you, I mean, think there's, there, I mean, there are loads of definition of brands and I, I love, there's a kind of old one from the American Marketing Association. It talks about a brand is a name, sign, symbol, logo or device, right? And, and I love that because usually with the definition, you kind of flick through it. But mm -hmm. if you think about film, a name, <laughs> right? Like straight away, you're like, oh, here we have all the challenges because how do I name it in a way you know, for a lot of people, and a lot of people I think who are deeply involved in film don't understand that normal people, whoever they are, or civilians, they don't go beyond the name. They're like, do you want to see a film tonight? Yeah, what's it called? Oh, I don't like comedy. And it's like, it's not a comedy, but you, that's what you thought from the name. So so the, the, the one key part is the name. What, what do we think by the name? Um, but then this sign, symbol, or design, that goes into, you know, those visuals. So the trailer, the poster, teasers, anything on social media that gives you an essence of the film. And, uh, and you know, we have kind of other people who know that better than me. We have reels of the game. We have, this is what a comedy looks like. This is what an art house film looks like. Um, so there are these kind of, these visual elements of the brand. And then there's the kind of more intellectual nature of the brand. What does it stand for? Uh, and then the other part of that definition uh, talks about um, it classifying it as similar to, but better than others. So again, you have to kind of remind people, oh, you liked these kind of things? Well, mm. this is like that, but this is why this is better. So we have a better script writer, we have a better director, the, you know, the music is better or whatever it is. So I think that's a really good point. And there was a question about budgets for marketing. You know, this is the kind of marketing activity you don't need a budget for. You just, you need to sit down and do a bit of thinking and, and anal an analysis to think about what are the elements of the brand uh, that we're starting with before you move on to kind of any formal kind of activity, I, I would mm. say. Mm. Uh, just to say hi to everyone else who, who, who's joined recently. Um, and uh, we are, we're talking... Oh, we're talking about brands and film, if you haven't already uh, gathered. Um, Tom, I'd like to move to, to you. Um, what, listening to what Fanola was saying there, how much, how similar does that sound to you when you're thinking about your campaigns at, at Hanway? Um, yeah, well, I mean, 
I see, um, I mean, so my, I work at Hanway now, but my background is in distribution. So for, for many years I was in distribution doing marketing. Um, and actually, although sales is a more business to business and distribution is more business to consumer, I think within the sales business now, um, we're, we're speaking to more than just acquisitions people. We're speaking to the marketing teams and the distribution teams and the publicity teams. So part of my job, with distribution is to minimize the risk to understand who an audience for a film is at the very beginning. Um, and actually going back to Fanola's point, you know, we, we, each film, I see each film as, as, as an individual brand. Um, it's, it's different to, it's different to brand. Well, I see film as a brand. What we're doing is we're launching, we're launching a brand each time a film comes out, but it's just a very high, high peak of awareness. And then it, and then it drops away. Whereas with a brand, like a clothing brand, you're wanting a, a lifetime of investment from uh, a consumer into that brand. So you'll always go and buy Levi's. You go back to, I think, to Fanola's point in terms of breaking down the film into different sub brands of like a director being a brand. You know, I think directors are probably one of the most successful brand builders. And actually, a few years ago, I was working with Ted Hope in, in San Francisco and we were doing a, an initiative about filmmakers thinking of themselves as entrepreneurs and as building a brand for themselves. And, and that was a really interesting project because it, it, it is really important as a filmmaker that you, you see yourself as a brand. Um, and you're, you're, cause you, you then have a direct relationship with your fans and your audience and having that direct relationship is something that I think all distributors strive to have. Um, but the challenge with running a distribution company is you, you, you rarely have one type of film. You know, there are, there are a number of different reasons why you acquire a film, but it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's not easy to just back award driven films or, you know, so I think um, if a director can think of themselves as a brand, it can really help um, creating that familiarity through, 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 through that uh, director's career. Um, and is I that do you, do you do that a hand way? Is that like a is that like something you you work to build yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, as well? so all, all, all branding is around communication, right, and building strategies and launching mm. launching. So, with each film that we we bring on to bring into Hanway, um, we do run analysis on on the project and we run a SWOT analysis, you know, in the same way that uh, an FMCG brand would run a SWOT analysis. We run that on every single film. Uh, and, and that's something I brought to our sales business, but it's something we used to do a lot in distribution. You know, you run these SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. When you're doing it at the end of a film's life cycle, you know, so for me now in my job, I, I work across the film's life cycle. So it could be two years, three years, five years. Um, it's not just that very small period of, of distribution, um, but through 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 that um, th through the through the process of, of, of running a SWOT analysis at the beginning, if you can do it at the beginning of a film, when you haven't actually fully cast the cast everyone and, and you've got script developments that you can make, you can actually change threats and weaknesses and make them opportunities and strengths much easier doing it at the very beginning as opposed to waiting until the film is finished and then trying to kind of retrofit it. Whereas that's why I find what I do now very interesting because you, 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 you can work with the filmmakers and the, and the whole team of filmmakers to, to identify weaknesses in the script that maybe can be changed to make the film a stronger film. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working at a very early stage with the filmmakers. Um, to develop their brand and their brand story. Because as Fanola was saying, you know, branding, communication, it's all about telling a story, like a brand, advertising, marketing, selling a story, a film is a story. And what our job is and what Daniel does at Think Jam is building stories around that story. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, but in terms of, we, we do a SWOT analysis, we, 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 we position each film at the very beginning as well. So before the film's even gone into production, we're working with the filmmaker team and understanding how we want to position that film, uh, position that film to buyers, but then also position that film to an audience. So when we're, if, cause we're at the very beginning of the, of the process, we can establish how we think the film should be best positioned. 
and then work with the, the, the production team to make sure that the, for example, the unit stills that we're capturing are gonna complement that film's position. You know, when I was in distribution, there were many examples where we would receive a shitload of images and nothing that kind of complemented the film's position, like an action film where everyone's having cups of tea or something, you know, just, it, there's a massive disconnect. So one of the things we try and do at Hanway, which comes out, came out of that frustration is making sure that we have an agreed positioning for the film for that brand and then we create assets and imagery that will complement it at all stages of the film so not just at, not just at the distribution side but assets that we can use to engage with buyers and, and distributors in this in in the sales process and each time we we take a film to a market we're trying to bring a new asset to the market so it may be a first look still the first market, the second time it may be um, a promo. Like we're always trying to create another bit of content that people can engage with. Cause I think that's what brands do successfully as well. You know, they're always offering touch points to their brand, different ways of accessing it. So in the same way of marketing a film, you, you, you've got to think of audience first, first and foremost, who's your audience? How do you want to position to that audience? And then what are the, all the different ways you can bring that audience in? Um, and, and, and what we try and do and what I've always tried to do is establish the hooks for that film in the same way that a brand would sort of establish its hooks. I think defining your hooks for your film will then, some of those hooks could be brands within the brand, <laughs> as it were. But for me, the hooks is, is really what you, you build your whole campaign around on. You know, for example, is this film based on real events? Like that's a key hook what is the specific event? What's the audience that is interested in that? And you can build these, these diagrams of audiences that can complement your branding. And, it, and it's very much the same. I mean, I never studied marketing, but I'd imagine it's a similar process of when you're, when you're marketing a brand, it's like you, you build an audience profile and then you build out the different potential appeals and you just try and connect the two. Maybe I'm simplifying it. <laughs> <laughs> Make it sound so easy. Um... Um, but yeah, I mean, branding is very important, I'd say. And, and, and we, we, look, we look as each film as an individual brand and, and each film has to have its own communication strategy. And that's what we start on at the very beginning. And I think the earlier you can begin, or the earlier you can agree on a positioning of a film with the team involved, the stronger position you are with the life of that film because you mm -hmm. can continually refer back to that reference and it gives you a focal point to keep coming back to, which mm. as we know in film, there's so much craziness going on that having a focus <laughs> is incredibly helpful. Mm. Well, Daniel, let me, let, me, let me jump to you. Um, so listen to, to what Tom was talking about there. You're, you're running the, the campaigns um, of, of these films. Um, and I'm just trying to unmute you actually. Okay, you're done. <laughs> I think we were both trying to unmute, it, unmute you at the same time. Um, yeah, so you're running, you're running the campaigns. You've, you've, you've got the brief from a, a distributor. Um, how do you, yeah, how do you communicate that branding? Do you, think, do, you, do you think of it like you're communicating a brand? We don't always, we don't use the word brand. We don't talk about brand. Uh, we talk about the movie. Um, but we use all the theories and um, processes to define what the brand is as you would a traditional product. Um, defining what the audience is, defining what the touch points are, defining what the, the story behind the story is, um, how do we engage that audience. Um, we talk about brand awareness because we want an audience to engage in what we're saying and what we're doing and make sure they see the movie for what it is. Um, where it differs for us slightly is if we're working on a property that has um, a much longer life, which might be a franchise, for example, um, or it's got a historical um, book or comic book um, um, part to it. So then we're looking at what's the long-term value of that brand. Um, some of those franchises that we're fortunate enough to work on, we work on two year strategies that are really defining and shaping what that brand journey is, how those audiences engage. I think for us, the, the, the interesting um, part is we're planning to, to launch a brand, to launch a, 
a, a, a movie. But actually, when you look back, once that movie's out and it's and it's done its job in cinema or at home, airplane TV, um, do you talk about it as a brand historically? Um, we we don't. So it's it's it's. I think that's part of the debate here, right? It's it's how do you actually term something? So we're we're planning everything for the brand. We're we're not necessarily looking back at it as a conventional uh, brand. Yeah, it's got it's, it's launched, and then it's it's, it's gone. <laughs> uh, um, but and, and what are you? Um, a little, little bit about Think Jam. So you're you're running social uh, digital campaigns, excuse me. And um, what uh, is there? I don't know if this is a very good question, really, but where, are you seeing uh, like particularly good channels to communicate uh, these like uh, the core values of a film or a brand identity of a film, or does it, or does it just depend? Totally depends. Um, it's totally specific on who the audience is, how we want them to engage, how we think they're going to engage, um, and where they are. It, it, a long time ago, it was it was very different where we put out our messaging and strategies, we'd build our websites and marketing campaigns, and we'd talk to the audience now more. The audience is, is, is talking to us and, and the social channels that are out there, they'll, they'll demand what they want to see and how they want to see it. Um, not every single movie is right for TikTok as much as it's mm. not every single movie is right for uh, Facebook or Digital Outdoor, you, you, we, we carve our campaigns depending on how we think we can get the most awareness and more importantly, how much we, how we think we can get the best, the best sort of bang for our buck for the marketing campaign to get thumbs on seats or mm. people watching our movies. I, I, that feedback from audiences, it, does that, does that, how does that, how do you take that and then feed it in back into your communication strategy, how you, do you do you sort of have to pivot at all sometimes based on what people you know what you're what you're getting back from people i think if if you if it's if it's one movie one release um with and we all know the the time and speed that we work to launch those movies um and all the approvals and legals and time that goes into creating all those assets um there is pivoting that you can do and adaptation that you can do clearly with social it's a lot easier and you can change the messages and change the tone when you're working on a franchise or a property that that is here for a while or here to stay um it's super important that we're constantly listening to that audience and understanding um what they want and how they change with with many of those properties um they age and there's big gaps between releases or between different announcements so it's making sure that you're staying relevant to what they want to hear and how you want to engage them. Makes sense. Um, I, I realized I, I was remiss and not, I didn't introduce uh, Shauna earlier. Uh, Shauna's here on the, on the, on the panel um, uh, looking uh, at, at questions. I think we've run a couple of polls so far. So um, Shauna, have we got, have we got any questions come in yet from, um, yeah, we got um, a couple here from Rowan uh, Malatra. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, so the question is, is it possible to have endless consumer facing film brands? I think that's kind of part of the oh, question oh. for distributors broadly. Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, next question. No, uh, Daniel, what do you reckon about that? Do, do you... Um, uh, do you see, there's obviously been a big rise in consumer facing, and I, I want to come to Ollie in a minute as well to talk about the sort of the usher you and the tech side, but uh, do, do you see there's been, there's been a big rise obviously in consumer facing platforms, like most recently Disney Plus. Um, is a is a space for, you know, do, you, do you think there's a space for an independent to sort of have that relationship? I, I can think of some really strong independent film brands, by the way, but what do you, what do you think? I, I can think of a couple of strong ones as well. I, I think, that, you know, the question we ask ourselves, and I think Fanola touched on this earlier, you know, it's why, why is that audience 
why do that why does that audience want to watch that movie and why do they want to engage mm. um are they engaging because of the lead cast or the director or the story type um or is it because of the distributor um or where it's made or the topic um mm. i think i think generally distributors have have struggled to define their own brand that that the audience the consumer says i want to go see that movie because it's that movie some have succeeded there's definitely a shift in the last couple of years where the streamers have defined themselves as their own brand first and then their portfolio of movies and tv shows and content is um second clearly they'll define themselves by type and they have a vast array of products but i think it's really interesting how we're we're now flooded by Disney Plus and HBO Max and Amazon Prime and Quibi and everything else. You know, it's Quibi first. It's not any of their properties. Mm. Um, and I think that's smart because actually my personal definition of a brand is the long-term brand value um, and how you continue to communicate with your audience to carry them on the life journey of that brand. And you sort of said before, some the movie's done, it's sort of, it's done in many respects and clearly it's done its job and made its money. But then the the Disney, Disney Plus launch was quite interesting, wasn't it? Because it, it, it was a brand in itself and then it had five strong sub-brands of Star Wars, Disney, uh, sorry, Pixar and Simpsons. So it, that was a great example of the overall brand is really strong, but they have so many great audience brands beneath it that they could use that to reach as broad an audience as possible. I mean, the other thing about branding, I mean, the benefit of a brand is it's a shortcut for, for the consumer. So we're overwhelmed. And so that question about endless consumer facing film brands, we can have them. But what we want are those intermediary brands who make life easier. And that's why you've got these kind of more bespoke distributors who, you know, this is my film taste. I trust them. I don't know what that is, but I'll watch it. And then you've got the, oh, sorry. I'll spend eight hours scrolling through the menu and trying to find things that I haven't watched already, you know, or generically kind of interesting product projects. And I think that's the really interesting thing that's happening now is how, how we're helped as a consumer to make sense of all of those brands and, and by association, what we might think of. Ollie, what's, what's your thoughts on all of this um, as a, as a tech entrepreneur um, in the film space um yeah tell, tell us tell us what you think yeah you know, it's, it's one thing i suppose what, what tom was mentioning there like i suppose you know, the core of what we're all trying to do is to maximize sales and it's you know that's what we all need to sort of focus on is how do we maximize sales i suppose any brand or particularly a movie what we all the biggest problem everyone faces is it's a cold start so um, amazon are always really sort of pushing that you know there's, once a movie first comes out, there's no prior audience. There is, you can have an idea who the audience is and what they'll like, but until it actually comes out, there's no real data to say, you know, this is who the audience are, this is why they'll like it. So, so everything that we're trying to do is to alleviate or to reduce that cold start to make sure that movie gets most people possible. And I suppose, you know, easy ways to do this is to position the movie, identify your audience, um, while the movie's in production, I think there's no better way to do it than to do experimentation. So to try different things, to try and actually prove or otherwise that this is the audience uh, for the movie. But like the, the reality is promoting individual projects is, is, is really expensive. Um, and I think it's actually interesting the point Fanula said about the Disney Plus um, you know, example and the different brands they have. You look at Tesco, you know, which brought, changed the yellow pack to, um, you know, there's that, the high end, the mid, mid level, their sort of, you know, unique ranges and whatnot. Like what we all need to do is to think of this on a, on a macro level, on a micro level. And I think for, from an OSHU perspective, what I think is most important is as, as a film company, be that a producer or a distributor or a filmmaker, we all need to sort of build our own brands. Um, and try to communicate that to try and help, I suppose, alleviate this cold start uh, problem. Um, and, you know, there is obviously Disney have done it for a long time. And, you know, on Onwards was a title that nobody had heard of or Coco. And they built that on the Disney brand. Um, A24 do a great job. 
um, as well. Um, but I think examples like Bloomhouse and Millennium show you people who take a lot of time to help people understand what their brand means and the type of movies you get. I think Annapurna, Altitude are probably other examples. And I think it's, it's, it's just about taking this long-term focus. And I suppose, you know, analogies from different industries, you know, an, an author or a, a publishing house doesn't just promote a movie, they promote, promote the author. And um, if you're releasing an album or a, you know, a, a band, you don't just release one song or promote that song. It's about the band and who's behind it. But I think it's just, it's, it's layering. It's interesting because, yeah. So, sorry, Tom. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I, I worked in San Francisco for a few years on, with, a, with a streaming service called Fandor. So it was a place for independent film lovers. That was the brand. And when I joined there, I quickly discovered that everybody loves film. So you can't, you can't market to film lovers. Like it's, it's nearly impossible to do that because everyone is a film lover. It's just their own personal choice. And where we found real success was kind of applying the, the, the strategy of, of, of campaign launches. So Fandor as a brand, we couldn't push the brand of Fandor because it had no legacy, it had no association, but actually strong award-winning films that were available and out there by association to Fanola's point, we would use award-winning films as, as kind of halo films to launch each week to bring in audience to the platform. So it wasn't actually, we, we didn't have the budget like Netflix or Amazon to afford exclusivity. I mean, cause exclusivity is where you get drive, you get brand loyalty, right? Because you can only watch it in that one space. Um, what, what was really interesting at Fandor is you could build really good engagement with individual genres like an lgbtq selection of films or a horror selection of films but and you could bring an audience in there but it was very hard to achieve scale at any one of those different genres uh, you know something like in the us like um, shudder does a really good job of like it's the home for horror streaming in the us like they know who their audience is it's horror indie fans and you can it's much easier to market indie horror fans than than film fans because you've got that extra subgenre that you can then build audience groups around. And I've got, <clears throat> so, you know, when we talk about, a... oh, sorry, when we talk about brands uh, in film, people quite often go straight to the elements of the brand, like the actor, director, genre, whatever. But the other thing is that I found in my research is context, like viewing context. So, so definitely there are cinema goers and, in, and then there are people who watch at home. And in cinema goers, there are event cinema goers and they want, you know, luxury, they want uh, reliability, they want to know exactly what they're gonna get. They'll probably go with other people, blah, blah. And then you've got film people and they are hunting for the knowledge, they're looking for the film, they're, the, the film is the most important thing rather than the venue. And then in the home viewing, you also have all this stuff like, what mood am I in? It's Tuesday, I don't wanna watch something that's longer than 90 minutes. So, so in terms of the brand as well, I think it's it's really important to go beyond the, the elements, but to think about what do you get? Like, so if you if you watch this, you, you get to know more about the subject or you get to show that you're someone who knows about ballet or history or whatever, but also you'll feel better, you'll feel, you know, excited or you'll feel kind of, you know, uplifted or whatever it is. So I think it's really important to, like you were saying in the beginning, Tom, like what is the USP or what is the hook? And thinking, you know, quite often you see really obvious ones. And in some of the plat streaming platforms, I think that's some, one of the mistakes is they think we watch a film because that person is in it or it's that genre. But, but it's much more collect kind, of, kind of complex than that. And we make our own... More emotional, kind of, isn't it? It's yeah, more emotional, yeah, more emotional. And so thinking about how that film fits into your story as a filmmaker, you know, who you are more generally, I think that that really helps us to think in terms of this brand at a, at a higher level than just the kind of obvious. I, I think there's, there's an interesting point though. We worked on some like R-rated movies for film companies to like family titles and where we do full ticketing, we can see it's the same people buying. So someone is bringing their, you know, their friends, you know, their, their whoever it is to the R-rated movie, their, their, it was a female led sort of movie. They're bringing their girlfriends to a movie for a night out, bottle of wine, whatnot, and then they bring their kids. So treating every movie in isolation has a lot of risk to it um, in that we're underestimating as well as the savviness of the consumer. And I think what we all need to do is actually to 
build the capability to measure this audience so that we can understand and segment them and what they're interested in. So if you're a you know, distributor doing cross genre content, what you need to know is that here's the people who like horror, here's people who like horror and family films, here's the people who see all our films, and then have a different communication strategy to try and convert them to a sale. Um, I think we all need to build better solutions be it through communication, tracking, to basically track does someone actually engage with the content and then make the marketing a little bit more specific so that we can actually you know, take them through this funnel more efficiently. It's people having a desire for collaboration though, isn't it? Because the, the, the challenge that everyone has is that each distributor has their own data sets and cinemas have their data sets and there isn't that collaboration where all that data comes in so we collectively can make conclusions so everyone's just working in their own silos there isn't that high level of collaboration that is really necessary for that that to become a reality i, I think i think some of us down to engagement tom like if you, mm -hmm. if you create just go and see my movie that's it you know you're not going to get that level of engagement between you and the consumers but if we can try like I always look at Secret Cinema and how great a job they do. Like it's nearly about gamifying and it's about surprising audiences and wowing them. And a lot of this, as Fanula said, you know, it's not expensive. A lot of this is actually just takes a bit of brain power to think of do what copy. that process looks like. Uh, and copy, which is what, what good branding is, right? Brand, good brands have good copywriters. It's a similar, yeah, similar process. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just, it's, I don't think, I think a lot of this, we, we think it's all, our budget's not big enough, but I think it's just taking a bit of creativity to say, well, who's the audience? What would they like? What does that journey look like? And then try totally to agree. Yeah, it's not, it's definitely not about budget. It's definitely not about budget because actually I, I found in my, you know, limitations push creativity, actually. Like the, if you've got a lot of money, it becomes a lot less interesting <laughs> in yeah. many ways. You know, yeah. actually, you need to have some budget, but you don't need a lot of budget, but you do need something to realize it. But actually having unlimited budget becomes actually quite boring. <laughs> As you could probably attest to, Daniel, you know, you've got loads of money. It's, well, you, you, you take the money, but <laughs> it, 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 the creativity isn't pushed as much as like, this is who we want to reach. We've only got this pool. What can we do best to get to that, that audience? It's much more interesting than saying, here's a million, just flood everyone. Um, I think it's fair to, I mean, I'll take your point, Tom, but I think it's fair to say we, some of our best work and some of the projects and campaigns that we've enjoyed the most with our clients are um, when, when you've got to be more creative um, and when you've got to be more targeted and when you, it, it, it's not just about the budget and not budget. It's also about when you take risks and it's about when you experiment. Um, and audiences are pushing for experimentation and audiences are hungry for different. That does, different doesn't necessarily mean just media first, but it's, I know we've done a lot in the past, Tom, when you do something different, creative, and it's highly engaging, the success is, the success can be much more overwhelming to create that brand affinity than just a blanket buy or a blanket um, spend. Does it just, does it all require a bit of a, a longer term strategy though is that is that part of what we're talking about here is that uh distributors producers film businesses just need to take a, a longer term strategic approach um is that is that as opposed to you know a film by film one i i would say in my opinion it's 100 percent. like i think we we can't we can't look at this and our relationships with consumers in isolation. Um, we need to be thinking, you know, not just one, two, five movies ahead. And I think then breaking it down into a marketing post by marketing post and campaign by campaign. It's saying that we want to hit a target of ten thousand user interactions. But I think the most important thing is actually to capture this data and hopefully. If you're doing competitions or quizzes or things like that, you're capturing an email address so that you can communicate with them. Um, I'd actually love to ask Daniel, is there, is there any examples of any like, amazing campaigns or you know, very innovative campaigns you've done? Um, He's done loads. We've done loads. I mean, we've, we've worked on, we've been fortunate enough to work on about 5,000 campaigns over the last 15 years. Picking one is probably... Um, being a bit unfair there's that they're, they're, they're good for different reasons some of my favorite campaigns actually date back quite a bit 
um, and one of the sort of it's a controversial statement in itself but an indie or that's not an indie but something like a fox searchlight subsidiary of fox you know fox searchlight to me felt like a brand because the type of movies that they they produced the quality the budget caps the storytelling the cinematography was absolutely stunning the theme um, and some of those movies that we were fortunate enough to work on we did some of our most exciting work not by virtue of the budget we were given, but just by virtue of the creativity that we were allowed to do. Actually, on a, on a side, there's a very interesting example of uh, focus features. They're, they're building kind of like a loyalty program for people who engage uh, with their content. So whether it be across, you know, streaming platforms or theatrical ticketing, it, it's very much trying to actually sort of build a relationship because there's a focused customer and there's a universal customer and you know they have that silo where they're trying to basically just to excite you know this particular brand mm. that uh, sounds like a that sounds like a technological mission to to pull pull all that data together maybe we shouldn't maybe we shouldn't go into any more detail on it now but um shauna i think we have some questions Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, there's one here that's um, kind of a bit specific uh, for Tom. Um, the question is from Casper Shirazi. Uh, when selling, positioning, or marketing a product at pre-sale stage, what are the marketing assets you use? Or does it, is that mainly based mm -hmm. on the value of them? Um, so so what, what assets do we create at the pre-sale stage? So yeah, yeah I mean, really, I mean, yeah, so we, we at Hanway, we'll, we'll always, I mean, again, it comes down to the importance that we place in positioning a film from the very beginning. So we'll agree on positioning and, and, and perhaps a, a genre that it label, um, that, it, that it, we think it would work in. Um, and then we create a, a sales artwork that complements that positioning. So we use that to take to market and, and launch, launch the film. So that, that would include a title treatment as well as the, the composition of the poster. We're not using photos from the actors of that film we're using. It's more kind of stylistically kind of graphic design. Um, but there's a challenge to make it look like a film poster and not a book cover. Um, you know, we've done it for long enough, so I think we were right at doing that. Um, but in terms of, um, so we're always thinking about how we position it. I mean, another way, another tool that we use as well, if we have the budget affording to us is to create a sizzle reel. So if we're launching a relatively new director, so there's a risk associated with them being a first time director and, and perhaps they've got a couple of key casts signed up, we'll then create a sizzle reel of two or three minutes that kind of projects the vision of that director using the director's statement and, and visuals from films that they aspire to make. And from with this one example we recently did, it used it, it was about um, an Olympic sport so we, we, we looked at different commercials and just got really strong visuals and pulled it together in a two minute, two minute video that kind of both got buyers excited, but also helped in the casting of further actors in the film as well, that the director then used as a like, this is my vision for the film. It was created by us, but the director then uses that as a way of recruiting more people into her vision. <laughs> If that makes sense. So yeah, we, we'll, we'll create that, and then we'll also work very closely with the producers and the filmmakers on identifying a shooting schedule and, and what days of the shooting scripts are, are most important to capture. That will then again complement the film's positioning. So again, we're always thinking about the positioning and how how we want to launch each film. Um, and we'll also try and do a press release. You know, if, unfortunately, still um, casting is an asset going back to Fernando's point of cast being a brand, they are an asset in terms of launching a film for pre-sale. Like they're, they're, there's a lot less risk if a distributor knows that they're gonna have a, an A-lister in their film that they'll be able to sell onto TV. It instantly reduces a huge amount of the risk because let's be honest, that, that's, that's the biggest part of the distribution game is, is, is mis risk minimizing. So we'll, we'll try and look at making sure that the right photographer is on board and, and that we are giving sort of specific days on the shooting schedule that we think really helps to complement that positioning of, of how we all collectively think of that film brand being launched. And then we'll use that unit still as the first still at the next market to say, hey, look, this is, this is where we're at now. And again, that still should then complement where our positioning was at the very beginning. So we keep this kind of constant 
referral back to the beginning mm-hmm. of how we want to position the film or the brand. I, I think just going. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just going to add a little bit uh, to Tom's point. We're seeing more briefs uh, and more planning done for the marketing campaign from set stage, mm. um, which we never used to see so much. Um, and there's more thought going into audience identification. As an agency, we're doing more anal- analytics on the potential audiences when the film's being shot or before the film's being shot, just even from script, which allows us to be, and, and the distributor or the producer, um, to be much smarter with the assets that they create that then can be used further ahead um, for the marketing campaign and you know there's there's cost efficiency there's storytelling efficiency there's consistency efficiency there's also tailoring efficiency because launching a launching a movie in the UK is really different to launching a movie in France or Germany or Italy but but the movie's only shot once so it's actually creating those custom materials up front that are tailored to each of those um, countries or demographics to get the best cut through but certainly a lot of that we're seeing done much earlier than we used to which i think is a good thing mm. yeah, yeah the earlier the better for sure i I, th- I think at that point you know the whole pre-seamer movement when it comes to sort of technology or you know kickstarter if you can capture you know making a movie the problems on set of the movie the cast you know the cast conversations you know interview the director early shots of an actor who was, you know, at the casting stage, who got this role, like any type of content like that, you can release as early as possible. We'll get people who have an interest to come to your site. I think what you really need to do is to capture that email. Someone says they want to watch it or demand it for their city. Um, and these, this pre sumer movement allows you to build, you know, hopefully 100,000 or a million uh, people who say they want to watch your movie. Um, it alleviates, again, that cold start where there's no data on a potential audience for your movie. And I think, I think what we're all trying to do is to de-risk, de-risk you know, making a movie a success. Um, and each step, as early as you can do it, de-risks a consumer to make a purchase because they'll know more about it, a distributor to take it on, or a, or a cinema to take it on as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shorter, sure, anything, anything, any other questions which are popping, popping out or popping up? Uh, yeah, I think um, a kind of a fun one from Nicholas Lazarus for everyone. Um, in your opinion, what's the most successful brand in the last year and why? Now, is that a film brand or a business brand? I'd like to come, I would like to come back to the business brand thing. By the way, I think we need to, I think we need to come back to that. But any guys, any um, Fanola, did you have any? Anything which springs to mind? No, I'm the worst person to ask for <laughs> one example of anything. I'll talk for five I mean, hours. I so, mean, the, uh, the, the worst affected brand is probably the beer brand Corona right now. <laughs> or the Irish band, the Coronas. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, um, do, do, let's, let's come back to this idea of a, uh, of a distribution company or a production company as a, as a brand. And... Um, and I, you know, it's definitely we understand that there's like this this tension between wanting to do that, but also like you can't always control with the, your your products and everything. What would uh, what would you say to a distribution company um, or you know or, or a production company that wants to start thinking about themselves more as a business to consumer brand. Can I answer this as a non-distributor? Because I think from the outside, what I've seen is that quite a lot of distributors have a brand. What they may not have done is articulated the brand or invested in, in the idea of it as a brand, but there is a logic to the projects that they support, right? There's something that makes that film a film for them and that they will know how to position that film to an audience they're familiar with. And I think that's the really important thing is really sitting down and thinking about that thread, what, what makes this the kind of film we wanna work on? And, and then thinking about what your brand stands for from that. So it doesn't mean it's the same kind of film all the time, but there is something about why you believed in that project. And I think that's where I think um, distribution companies don't use their, channels well so you can tell your story really easily you know in your home page or like some content you release on your social feeds that 
that continue that kind of thing of like this is who we are and this is who we stand for in a really kind of straightforward kind of way but that's yeah that's my view we're, we're taking the lessons from tech right because in tech you need a very clear call to action don't you on your site of like this is who we are that call to action is there's a lot to be learned from tech i think for distributors in terms of cutting to the chase of actually who you are and what you represent um, that, i mean yeah. there is there is a challenge with the diversity of films i mean the, it feels like there is an opportunity to as we as a district to, ha to have a distribution company that has a more direct consumer relationship that's built around a genre maybe i mean i don't know i just think things like crunchyroll in the us is, is a really good example of they have the anime everyone knows that's where you go to if you want to watch great anime um shudder maybe as well the, 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 i think in the uk there maybe isn't a big enough audience pool potentially to and then you've got the challenge of of, of of rights management and actually having the rights to the films and then having the the volume of films that you can put out i think i think what you're saying there tom is there's a natural segmentation anyway mm. you know if someone's just doing it for the uk that's a clear sort of segment starting point if they're doing you know documentaries and drama you know then that's another segment it's, it's just to build those segments and try fill the pools like, yeah I, by anyway. building segments you can create scale because at individual segments you can't build, build scale so thereby your financial operational financial operation has limitations because you you're not bringing the revenue to to, to get that scale <laughs> yeah and, and if you if you've got success with a sports documentary you know you, you might want to take on the next sports documentary but it's capturing that data um, for the next release. I, I think that there's one thing which I, is my total pet peeve in this space is people setting up social media channels for every new movie. The audience gets built, they might get some great numbers um, and then they're kind of starting again. And from a, a brand building perspective, it's, it's terrible. Um, like there's, there's simple things you can do, which is if it's a Facebook page, change your image and your the name in the short term so that you're actually bringing the traffic through to your central page you know, like the, your company name page. Um, and another thing which actually kind of annoys me is there's, there's always a, a focus on building standalone websites for every movie. And again, your audience is getting segmented. So it's taking this longer term presence, I think is important. I think, can I jump on that a little bit? Because um, I, I, I think that's, I think that's a fair point, but it's, it's easier said than done when understanding the audience that you want to target because they won't necessarily know where to go for a default distributor based on that movie. So actually, I think they all feed into each other. I think the individual social pages and hashtags and channels help create awareness for those stories and for those for the history of the audience, but then they can ladder up to a more um, corporate entity to then start building up its, um, its database. But I don't think that needs to be done for every single um, studio. I actually don't think every single studio needs to, or, or distributor, I should say, sorry, needs to define its own um, brand. And if it does define its own brand, define who the audience is. It doesn't matter if it's um, um, B2C or B2B. Some distributors can be re really successful as, as a B2B brand that's very well known within the industry but doesn't have to worry or necessarily spend money to be out there as a B2C um, like brand. Like Blumhouse yeah. is a great example of that. Yeah. Really strong brand within the industry. People don't necessarily go and see a Blumhouse film. Correct. Yeah. Where I think uh, like an A24 is about curating a vision of what good movies are about and people buy into that vision. Well, they're, they're a kind of more, I think A24 is a distributor, but it's, they're, what they're attempting to do is build more of a lifestyle brand. Than a film brand there, I think, you know, exemplified by selling candles and things like that. Like yeah. that's that's lifestyle. Um, I think like, they've, yeah. they, they, they've done a very good job in doing that. Actually, probably the only distributor out there that's outside of Disney that's had a really good crack at defining a, a brand, a distributor brand, a, a distributor as a brand, um, defined by quality quality films. I think. Well, that, what what do you think? Sorry, I'm asking a question, but like, what do other people think about the idea that? brands are claimed so uh, you know a24 will claim the lobster they're one of a number of companies that were involved in that film coming to life so i'm not i'm not 
you know, complaining about their claiming it. But you see that all the time in Netflix original. If you look at the project, where the project came from, it was somewhere else. Or I don't know, how does that work in terms of branding? For me, that's a branding challenge because if multiple people claim a project, then which brand benefits most from that project? I mean, a film, film is a collaborative process. So by the nature of that collaboration, there are many owners that can take a slight ownership of that. And I think it's hard to, to deny that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, each distributor has its own. It's hard, it's a hard one that. I think, I, th I think what's interesting, and I sort of mentioned before about looking forward to a brand or looking backwards. I think um, when you look backwards and you look at a distributor's library and you make awareness regard around that library, it, it helps build a brand or it could help build a brand retrospectively because people can then associate those titles with that distributor. And someone who's doing something I think is quite good at the moment is with, you know, Lionsgate Live, who's got a really, Lionsgate have a really good library and they're doing Lionsgate Live. It's promoted as Lionsgate Live. It's, it's B to C Lionsgate Live. I don't think people, general public would necessarily know that Bendit Lie Beckham is a Lionsgate movie, but they're framing it under that umbrella and it's creating that brand um, on its own, looking at the catalogue, which I think is smart. Mm. Mm. Very, uh, very good B to C initiative. Um, Sean, have we got, we've got time for one more question, if there's something there. Sorry, uh, just coming off of mute. Um, yeah, okay, uh, quick one. What is the best uh, marketing platforms for a small film distributor, uh, niche one-man independent film distributor? <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to look at Vimeo and all those different distribution tools as just that distribution tools. They're, they're a way of putting your film out there. But I'd say most of them, or if not all of them, require you as the, as the film creator to be the marketer of that film, whether you're the distributor or the, or the individual filmmaker. I, I, I haven't seen a, a streaming tool out there that actually integrates audience into it where you actually it becomes a marketing tool as well as more, more than just a, a, a playing tool of the film. There isn't that marketing element built into it mm -hmm. that, I, that I've come across. Oli, do you want to... Uh... I, I didn't actually hear the question, Alex. Okay, the, the, the question was, um, can you recommend the, the best digital platform for an independent distributor? Yeah, the best marketing platform. Oh. Best marketing oh, platform. Oh, sure, you. No, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> my uh, plug. Like, and we, like our, our solution, we look at movies past, present, and future. So we have a way to show your past catalog and future. Um, you know, so if, if, there's, if there's an interest, I'm happy to chat to anyone about it. But ultimately, what we're trying to do with our home for film solution is to enable someone to show all their movies, enable fan engagement across a movie company um, and convert those to sale, whether it be a, a digital streaming sale or a, you know, a ticket sale in, in cinemas. Cool. Um, so uh, we're coming to the end of our, of our chat. I guess I'd like to just quickly ask the panelists for one, one recommendation each, one piece of advice or thought from their own experience in terms of this, this idea um, of uh, thinking about film as a brand or, or not. <laughs> it doesn't, you don't have to jump down on that, but it, it, one piece of advice in thinking, I suppose, you're not thinking about film as a brand, but thinking longer term about your, uh, your business and uh, your audience. So I, anyone can, can jump in. Um, I suppose what I would say, <clears throat> the most important thing is to build a web presence across your web and social media, to attract as many people through to your website with clear calls to action to engage with your content. Um, I think the last thing I'd say is that Rome wasn't built in a day, so don't expect like everything to happen all at once. It's about you know, a long-term process takes a long-term approach. So it's taking lots of small wins to help you climb Everest. I mean, I would say that, yeah, you, you need to, how, how you want to position your film, how you want to determine how you want to position your film in the marketplace, like that, that to me, and think about audience at the very beginning before you've even made the film is, is a really critical consideration, you know, and your audience could be just your mum, 
that's fine. You just have to define who that audience is at the beginning so that it will give you confidence in, 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 in making a film that will speak to the audience. You know, if you know where you want to go, it's much easier to get there than, than you have a bit of a clearer path, I suppose. So positioning to me is really critical and understanding who the audience is you're making the film for and sticking to that and using that as a referral all the way through your, your filmmaking process. Because as we've all said, like making a film can be, you know, it can take years. So even just getting the film released could be years before. And then you've got the long tail afterwards that could be another 10, you know, however many years. So it is, it's definitely, it's definitely a, the long game. I think to Ollie's point, you know, it's not, it's not, you can't, you can't get there very quickly. It's, it's about investing in yourself and, and uh, building a brand for yourself, perhaps if, if that's the right thing. I would say it's about thinking about the story. So where does the story start? So what's the origin point that you want? And then where do you think it's going to go afterwards? So. I, I, I think sort of almost tying some of those things together. I think it's um, start, you know, don't, don't, don't ignore the, the time you're making your movie and planning your movie to not think about the, the brand and the audience and the positioning. Um, start early and start analyzing early and start experimenting early um, yeah. and that that will define uh, the story and the journey of what that property looks like and I don't think you should have to rush into it either you know I don't think necessarily you do have to release a lot of content during production necessarily because um, it's again film is launching film is all about timing again right so it's it's when the time is right so how do you build momentum towards your film um, I wouldn't say necessarily that on, you should be tweeting each day from set going, oh, this is a great day on the set because you run the risk of exposing stuff that maybe there'll be an element of surprise for down the line, which could generate more publicity. Like I think that there is some kind of control over how you release the content and having a, I guess, a strategy of how you release that, a communication strategy for during production, if that's what you choose to do, but just be clear about what your objectives are from that. Um, because you don't want to, you don't want to put everything out too early as well. Because it is about slowly building an awareness um, and, and building a momentum to a specific launch date, whether that's your festival launch or whether that's your launch to consumers. Again, like launch dates can be there can be many different launch dates on a particular film as well. Um, so it is definitely the long the long game on each one. Well, uh, we were slightly over time, so I think I've had to, to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, um, Tom, Fanola, Ollie, and Daniel. Um, it's a fascinating conversation. This will be available uh, to stream, so we'll, uh, we'll share the link. Um, Tom, don't do that with your uh, Hello, Tom. background. <laughs> <laughs> it just freaks everyone out. Forest man. Please, please do that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, and so next week is our last week, um, the, the finale of the future of film marketing, when we are going to, and we didn't really talk much about the future this week, did we? But we will be talking exclusively about the future next week uh, and what film marketing might look like um, in, in the new reality, the new normal. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining and uh, have, a, have a good rest of the week and the day and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks guys.